And now it's time to welcome our first guest in a segment we call Bark in the Park. Jean Donaldson is a dog mom. She is a master trainer and she's the owner of the Academy for Dog Trainers. She has contributed so much to her field over the course of her career. And we are delighted to have Jean with us today from San Francisco, California. Jean, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So Jean, there is so much territory to cover with you today. We are so thrilled, but we'll start with an important first question. Where did your love for dogs come from? I'm pretty convinced that I was born this way. Um, <laughs> ever since I can remember, I've been fascinated by dogs. There was clearly somebody in there. Um, and I always wanted to sort of have a dog, always wanted to be around dogs, always wanted to watch them. Um, so I think I was just a born a dog mom. Oh, that is so, so sweet. And, you know, you had this passion for animals and for dogs in particular, because we know once we fall in love and once we know that love, that's kind of it. But you also have a love and passion for music, I understand. So how did you make this transition from music to, to dog training and training trainers? Well, when I was in college, I was a music major, okay. um, but was also at that time competing in dog sports and had a couple of dogs um, and sort of was kind of doing doing both. And as time went on, I took more and more college courses to do with animal learning, to do with behavior, um, and ended up sort of, you know, at the crossroads. So in 1990, I wasn't sure if I was going to, you know, continue in dogs. Maybe I was going to be a writer. Maybe I was going to, you know, go into animal advocacy. Maybe I was going to stay in music. I wasn't sure what I was going to do or, or stay in school. And then I had sort of like a, a serious illness. I had like a complicated appendectomy. Um, and then I was in hospital. So I was in hospital for five weeks. And, and those experiences, as rotten as they are, they can be very clarifying. Um, and it became clear to me that if I, if I lived, I was going to do dogs. I was going to go into dogs. I was going to go into behavior. And I did. And, and that was sort of like a, a real pivotal point. And I ended up um, going into dogs and deciding I was going to devote my life to helping dogs. And, and that's what I did. Wow. What an inspiring story. You are so right. Life is too short. So let's do what we love and love what we do. And you yeah. are doing that. And I'm so thrilled for you, Jean. You mentioned that you were thinking about writing too. And I know uh, that you actually published your first book in 1996. So how did that experience affect your career path? Well, um, I think that it was probably something that put me a little bit more on the radar. When I wrote it, I had no conception that it would ever even be published. But when it was, um, I ended up with sort of more educational opportunities. And I began to think about the idea sort of at the back of my mind that there really was not a career path for dog trainers. Um, I, like so many people, I had pieced it together. I'd done college courses. I'd done dog sports, going to seminars, trial and error, sort of with clients, with classes. Classes, uh, but there really wasn't sort of a way to become a dog trainer the way there is to become a doctor or a plumber or a nurse or, or so many other things. Um, and then, um, so a few years after that first book, I got the opportunity um, in 1999 to go to San Francisco um, from, I'm from Canada and start the Academy for Dog Trainers. So I spent, uh, you know, some many months sort of, you know, tr um, working on the curriculum and, and that was sort of of how I was able to transition from uh, only doing classes and cases to actually helping dog trainers to fulfill their career dreams of becoming a trainer. I love that. So you recognized a pain point and then you said, okay, I can do something about this. And then you actually did it. So explain to us the structure and the curriculum at the Academy for Dog Trainers. How is everything set up? So originally we worked for 10 years with a six week kind of full time curriculum. Um, and then when, uh, when I left the SPCA, I had a year and a half to sort of reinvent the curriculum into the format that it is now. And the way it is now is it's two year curriculum and it is two year part time curriculum, which is done entirely online. 
Um, and one of the advantages of that is that it has allowed for some expansion of the content. It's allowed for people also to kind of marinate in the concepts, you know, sort of, you know, to, to learn something, go away, come at it from different directions, think about it, come up with questions, and then also supervised practice. So because we're not trying to pack everything into a six week period, uh, when people start going out in the world and doing classes and taking cases, we can oversee their practice. Kind of like when you're a physician, you first do medical school, but then you do supervised practice in the, in the form of residency and internships. Oh, that's fantastic. And that support, honestly, is invaluable through the process. It is. So you mentioned technology and things online and technology is changing rapidly. I mean, it seems like almost by the second. Um, how has technology changed or impacted the dog training industry since you first started? You've watched so much change. It's just an enormous. I mean, the internet has been the single biggest change. Um, and one thing that we found was that originally in the original curriculum, we were coaching students at their actual hands-on technique. We were coaching them live um, on shelter dogs. And when we converted to an online format, we then started to do that via video. So students will upload a video of themselves training. We'll then give them written feedback. And then the student can look at that um, and, and see, okay, at three minutes and 57 seconds, you did this or the dog did this and we would like this or this was great or this was uh, something you need to work on um, and then they could resubmit another video and it turned out to be rather a pleasant surprise that that this uh, was a very good way to coach students the other thing I've seen in the profession as a whole was when the pandemic hit a few years ago um, a lot of people who were doing primarily live training with uh, cases consulting and with classes they had to kind of reinvent themselves and 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 figure out how to get that job accomplished by using Zoom and by using um, the internet. And it turns out now that people are returning to more normal life, but a lot of those trainers are keeping some of their online offerings. So it turns out now that somebody, if they're in a geographic location where there isn't anybody who's well-trained, because dog training is not regulated, yeah. um, and if there's nobody uh, competent in their immediate location, they can still get very good expert help by somebody um, in an online format. And that's been something that's actually been kind of a gift from the pandemic. Oh, for sure. And it's good to hear the positive uses of technology and, and how technology can actually serve us as well. Not to mention the resiliency of dog trainers and folks like you during a hard time in the pandemic, those amazing lessons that came out of it. Now, you did mention something just a moment ago, and I, I know that you can really share helpful information with us, that the dog training is not really a regulated industry. So what are some of the concerns that you have? Um, can you touch on that for us? Yes, um, consumers need to be aware that it is kind of the Wild West out there. So in the United States, there is literally no regulation of dog training, unlike for somebody who might do your manicure or somebody who is a contractor working on your house. There's no minimum education, there's no licensing, there's no oversight. There are optional certifications, so people can elect to get a good education and get themselves certified as a trainer, but it is not mandatory to do so. And so when somebody who's a very, they might be a very devoted dog mom and they might live with their dog, they might go on the internet or, or a, a contact a local trainer and they might get somebody who's very humane, very well trained and very versed in how to help them or they may get somebody who's literally hung out a shingle and knows nothing or is inhumane or both. Wow. And so it's really important that um, for consumer protection purposes, um, we encourage people to kind of have a buyer beware mentality, to be a, a critical consumer and to look carefully at the information that dog trainers provide about themselves and their services. We want them to look for language that suggests, first of all, that they've had an education, Second, that they're certified by some independent body uh, and that they use a no force uh, training method. Um, so beware of kind of murky language about how the dog is going to be motivated. Um, murky language suggesting that, well, you know, it's OK, we're using an electronic collar, which between you and me, that means a shock collar. But it really is just a tap on the shoulder. Hmm. 
be careful about that. If we want to tap dogs on the shoulder, we can say, hey, hey, come over here. Or we can literally tap the dog on the shoulder. We don't need to use electric shock. Um, so these trainers who continue to use force are aware that it's becoming illegal, that people are getting smarter. And so they're resorting to more murky euphemisms and um, obfuscating language to, to kind of maintain their market share. And so people who are consuming dog training services want to be very critical about that. Yeah, and that's an incredibly dangerous situation because the last thing that we want to do is subject our dogs to abuse or bad habits. Yes. We need trained professionals who know what they're doing, that's for sure. Now, what are some of the other red flags, though, that you look for? I mean, I, I know you, you're against, obviously, an NDA. Walk us through that. Yes, that's right. Um, so recently, it it became apparent that there was a large national franchise, um, which was not only um, sort of subjecting dogs and their moms to poor practitioners who were not very well trained, but that they had all these really good reviews. Um, and so it sort of got it. And all of us who were in the profession were always sort of puzzled for many years about how these people could possibly have such good reviews. And it emerged recently that when somebody signs on, so, you know, unless you read all the fine print in the uh, agreement that you, you uh, agree to when you engage their services, that it turns out that if you would like to have a refund, so if that person makes a big mess of your dog and makes them worse or subjects them to something which is inhumane, and then you would like to have your money back, the condition for getting your money back is that you do not disparage them, that you do not post a bad review, you do not uh, hire legal representation. So in other words, you can't sue them, you can't even post a bad review. Um, and that is something which, as it turns out, is actually not legal. You cannot make a terms of service contingent on not providing um, a, a bad reviews. Um, so not only are they doing something which is kind of immoral, they're actually doing something that's illegal. And, and flat out scary too. That kind yeah. of control should not fly. Any professional with credentials should should not have that fear, right? right. So you're yeah. right, that's a red have flag. To, you have to yes. even be careful about the reviews. Yes, and so incredibly helpful tips. Uh, how can our viewers, because there's so much that you have to share with us, how can they stay on top of, of what's going on with you and all of the exciting things happening at the Academy for Dog Trainers? There's a couple of places. So one, the Academy has a website, academyfordogtrainers.com, um, where people can go to find out about sort of the, the big program if they're interested at all in becoming a behavior professional. There's also a course uh, offered by the Great Courses, uh, which is Dog Training 101. And that's one that that's aimed at people who have their own dogs. So it's not people who are aspiring dog trainers, they don't want to be a professional, but they want to train their dog using the latest and greatest methods. They can go there to the great courses and, and uh, find Dog Training 101. Well, that sounds inspiring and incredibly helpful. Jean Donaldson of the Academy for Dog Trainers. Thank you so much, Jean. You take care. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching this Dog Mom News clip. Do us a favor, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more informative and awesome Dog Mom News content. And be sure to click that notification bell too to stay up to date with all our new content in real time. You'll also wanna be sure to join us for our live stream each Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great day, everyone, and we'll see you soon.